Good. OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me today, Fermin. Um, as you said, I'm going to speak in English. I shall try and speak clearly and slowly and explain what this topic of embedded finance is all about. I think to sum up, it's about new types of digital business models. And as you know, the people on this call know, being specialists in this area, most companies tend to spend most of their time uh, trying to improve their existing business model and digitize it. But most of the innovation happens in other places, um, which tend to be more platform-based business models. And they, if they are executed effectively, can be very, very powerful. And in my work with the World Economic Forum, uh, I've identified four main types of platform business models, which are uh, proving so successful today. And I'll briefly introduce them to you now. The starting point is often what we might call new types of digital solutions, doing much better using digital technologies, what has been done before. And a lot of the first generation of fintech companies uh, were examples of that, being able to get bank accounts more easily via mobile phones, for example. But now intelligent digital solutions are using artificial intelligence and other technologies to do even more exciting things. And you mentioned at the beginning some examples of, of Latin American um, fintech businesses, which I've put here. Um, but there's some incredible innovation going on around the world, trying to deliver financial services more effectively. Now, developer platforms is becoming the new battleground. And those of you who are from the, the technology world, you may well know Twilio, which is a, a developer platform that helps uh, embed communications into, into interactions between businesses and consumers. And we're starting to see a huge growth of developer platforms emerging in financial services as well. And not only startup businesses like Rails Bank, but also some of the incumbent banks like Sabadell in Mexico and BBVA, who are offering their capabilities to developers to embed in, in their services. Now, online marketplaces is another type of, uh, of digital business model, and you'll know some of the ones I've listed here. In insurance, we're starting to see more of this, an example being Policy Genius. And the most powerful digital business model is when you orchestrate a whole ecosystem of uh, activities even beyond your core business. And Ping An from China is a wonderful example of that. So the question is, where does embedded finance fits in? And to my view, it's about enabling more and more of these digital platform business models um, and indeed improving the digitization of existing businesses. So let's try and define what we mean by embedded finance. This is my definition, and I would love to get your feedback on this and how we can develop this. But I've, I've tried to define it like this. It's about abstracting financial services functionality into technology so that you can enable any product or service provider or developer to integrate innovative financial services into their own customer propositions and experiences. And there tend to be two ways of doing this today. One where it's a visible add-on to a proposition that already exists, for example, extended warranties on products that you might buy from the internet or indeed insurance being offered at the same time as buying a, a flight or a travel service. Or it could be an invisible native component of a service. The consumer doesn't see it. The, the service provider has just bundled it in to their core proposition. But the key thing about embedded finance is it needs to be, or to be successful, personalized, helping to create personalized solutions for, for users and relevant to the context in which the, the financial service needs to be consumed. And ultimately it's about providing better customer experiences for every business. It has to be about very easy integration and importantly, leveraging more real-time data from multiple sources and enabling new growth. 
And on the right hand side here, I've shown a few examples that you're probably aware of. For example, Uber, whereby payments are just embedded in the service and increasingly Uber offering bank accounts to drivers, digital wallets being off offered by companies like Starbucks or insurance being connected to devices based on the behavior uh, that, you, that you undertake or indeed investments being embedded into your e-commerce activity by UEBAO in, in Alibaba's ecosystem. And if you're a user of WeChat in China, there's all kinds of financial services that you can access through their ecosystem. But what's most exciting, whether you're either a, a VC, um, a private equity company, a startup, entrepreneur, tech company, or indeed an incumbent financial service institution if you look at the if you look at the uptake of embedded finance so far and project it forward you get to some very very interesting numbers and on the right hand side here is some analysis i've done showing the potential value creation of in, of organizations that enable embedded finance in 10 years time and how that compares to the total value of financial institutions today, or indeed software companies today. And what's happening is that new types of organizations are leveraging financial technology to create new types of propositions for new customer groups. And the projection is that these businesses that enable this whether they're businesses that exist today, like Square or Stripe or some of uh, the other startup companies, or indeed new companies that don't even exist today, the projection is that the, this could be very, very exciting into the future. And the question for all of us is, where do we play in this market and how do we win? Well, I'm hoping that that figure you see on the right-hand side there is enough to excite you that there's something interesting here that we need to look at. Now, what does this mean for uh, merchants of different types? Well, I'm, I'm going to share with you a, a number of examples here. For software businesses, people who are enabling other businesses uh, through software, uh, projections suggest that by adding, for example, payments to their proposition, they could increase their total addressable market or indeed their average revenue per user by two to five times. If you're a retailer of products, uh, and particularly a small retailer, often the profits on selling the, the, the product, in this case, a bike, are very, very slim and small indeed. But if you can add insurance really easily to your proposition, in many cases, you can increase your net profits by 50%. And indeed, if you're a manufacturer of products, if you can embed at point of sale, the ability for, for people to uh, get a loan to buy the product or pay in installments or indeed add insurance so they can be more comfortable about uh, whether the product breaks down later on, then my analysis shows that you can increase order values by 20% and indeed increase conversion by, in many cases, 50%. So if you're a fintech or you're a financial institution, by enabling these types of businesses to embed different types of financial services, you're helping them to create new commercial value and you're, getting, you're creating a new market for your capabilities. And the point is in the definition that I gave before, this is about seamless integration using APIs. It's not about those long cumbersome processes that we go through now to try and uh, set up these capabilities. And indeed, there are so many applications that we've just scratched the surface. I, and I love this example from Africa, um, which is about providing electricity to people who have no electricity today. And a company called Zola makes uh, solar panels. And solar panels are very expensive to buy for people who don't have large incomes. So what they did, they embedded loans and payment capability through the mobile phone to enable people who have no electricity today to suddenly be able to afford uh, and, and use solar panels so that they, get, they are now able to light up their house 
and, and uh, power their equipment. And over the last 10 years, uh, there, are, there, are sort of, there are now 400 million people who are now using this capability who in the past didn't have that possibility. So we've just scratched the surface of what is possible when we can embed financial services into products that deliver real value to people. And there's a lot of um, reason why now is this, this trend is emerging very fast. And COVID is clearly uh, demonstrating how poorly served many people are today in terms of insurance for healthcare, in terms of being able to get credit when they need it, when times get bad. And we know that technology and digitization is accelerating across every sector and, ex and is accelerating um, the demand for new solutions. And we also know that there's a lot of investment money uh, floating around, so-called dry powder, looking for new things to invest in. So all these things mean that embedded finance becomes even more important, particularly as the boundaries between sectors are blurring so that there are the, the possibility to create new solutions that combine different aspects of different uh, vertical sectors are now becoming possible and platform business models are dominating in every sector. So what does this mean in the, for, for banks and insurance companies? Well, technology and digitization is changing the nature of the, of the capabilities that are um, able to be exploited by uh, entrepreneurs and others. And the old world of, of a bank providing all the services itself are changing and all these different elements you can see in the financial in the banking stack here can now be offered by other people payments for example or compliance services or different types of banking products are now being able to be offered by other people not just the bank and it's the same in insurance as well underwriting capabilities claims management new products and so on are now being able to be offered by fintechs and this is creating, I guess, many, many new solutions. It's enabling many new players to enter the market. There's new infrastructure that is being built. And this is creating new battlegrounds uh, between banks, between startups and insurtechs, with, between uh, big technology companies, and those who are controlling the end user interface. So as you know, most people spend much more time on things like WhatsApp or Facebook or increasingly um, services like, um, like Rappi than they do in the banking or the insurance company's app. And so we have a battle for um, the attention of users. And we're now starting to see new developer platforms and marketplaces aggregate the capabilities uh, of banking and insurance companies and making them available to non-financial services platforms and apps. And the, the question is, if, you're, if you work for a bank or an insurance company, is the danger that we might be relegated to just providing people access to our license or, or, or offering rather commodity capabilities? Are other people going to be grabbing uh, the more valuable origination and distribution capabilities uh, that we had control of in the past. And blockchain is emerging, of course, which is creating new digital assets that, again, are being made available through different channels. So what we're seeing now is many different players involved in embedded finance with different needs. And in this map here, you can see how I've, I've made a contrast between incumbent businesses that's either traditional enterprises and traditional banks and insurance companies, and then the digital native companies. So that's either startup businesses, fintechs, who are now very powerful on the right-hand side, and digital businesses from outside of financial services, who are, as we know, extremely powerful. And these organizations all have different needs. The, on the top left, enterprises now, they know they need to digitize faster, and they also need new revenue streams and new growth. And if you're a retailer, 
under pressure for margins, or you're a telecoms company with the same problem, is there the opportunity to embed financial services to take advantage of your large customer base and generate new revenue from doing so? If you're a bank or an insurance company, you need new channels to market. You want people, more customers to use your products. And you need, you're looking for new growth. And are the old ways of trying to create partnerships um, with existing enterprises, are they uh, effective enough as, we, as our whole sectors digitize? Now, for the digital natives, they, they, they don't want to um, create long, complex RFP processes to look at how they could embed financial services into their products. They want APIs that they can test quickly. Uh, they want access to new sources of data uh, so they can create new solutions for their customers. And so for traditional companies, whether they're banks or they're um, traditional enterprises, they need to provide the same type of API-led platforms that developers who are creating digital services need to take advantage of to create more exciting, intelligent digital solutions. So just finally, I would say for us all, that those are, if you like, commercial benefits or opportunities for commercial organizations. But embedded finance has the potential to help us all as individuals, as citizens, and as society. And particularly if you think about financial inclusion, helping people to save better, helping people to get loans that are, that are cost effective, helping people who may, may only have live on $10 a day to get healthcare insurance and other types of insurances and helping the world to achieve its sustainable development goals. So I believe that financial technology, it's, it's accelerating so fast, it has the potential to be the world's new innovation platform. Just as mobile and the cloud has been today, this new type of innovation platform, financial technology, can enable embedded finance, finance to be embedded in all kinds of activities that we take part in throughout our lives. So thank you very much. I hope this has been a useful stimulus for our discussion today. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for sharing uh, those insights, that vision about, about the, the opportunity. Well, it seems to me that, that embedded finance is trying to solve the problem that banks have been trying to solve with a generic approach for decades and centuries. But now with embedded finance, brands and non-financial companies could solve that financial need at the right moments, right? Within the context and with a lot of data, right? Is that correct? Is my interpretation correct here? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, you know, often, you know, often I want to be able to pay for something. I want maybe insurance or I want a loan when I need it. And increasingly as an individual, I'm accessing those services online, either through the mobile phone or, or through the web. And I would prefer the financial service to be available there and then. You know, if I if I buy something, I don't really want to call up the insurance company and arrange some insurance. I don't really want to call up the bank and arrange a loan. It would be much more convenient for me if that was embedded in that experience exactly when I need it. And I think that's the, the key opportunity. Um, and particularly for merchants and retailers to be able to embed that. As I said, I showed those examples that show the commercial benefits for them to either attract, retain, or add more um, value to, to what they sell to their customers. You mentioned that you know, some brands could be expanding their revenue base or the total addressable market by two to five, right? Seems like a huge opportunity to let go for many non-financial companies. Could you spend a bit more on this? Yeah, exactly. So if you are a, a B2B software company, for example, and you serve you know, a vertical market like the, let's call it the restaurant sector, and you provide you know, operational software to help restaurants run better. 
Now, at, currently, the restaurant will have to speak to someone else about managing payments, online payments or, or digital payments. Now, if you're the software company providing the, the operational software, why can't you, or well, you're in a very good position to also offer payment capabilities to the restaurant? And, there, and now it's possible to do. Uh, and if you do that, I, I gave that example, the addressable market that you have is much bigger because payment volumes are quite significant uh, compared to buying the, the operational software from the, that, that you're providing. So for, for B2B software companies, SaaS-based software companies, you know, this is a, a very bit significant opportunity. Yeah, actually, you, you've mentioned a number which is mind-blowing, $7.2 trillion US dollars globally, right? Twice the value of the 30 largest financial institutions. Who, who's going to capture this value? Who, who's best positioned to do it? Well, at the moment, it is, it's, I mean, I say tech companies, fin, you know, technology companies, uh, because they know about APIs, they know about platform business models, they know about creating ecosystems around themselves. So if you, you know, if you look at the top 10 financial institutions in the world 10 years ago, they were all banks, uh, they're all big banks. If you look at the most valuable financial institutions today, half of them are not banks. The, the biggest one is Visa. The second is MasterCard. Um, PayPal is, I think, is the fourth. Ping An is a company that completely transformed itself. And you're, and you, you know, if Ant Group does its IPO, it'll be in the top three. Square and Stripe and other companies, and those are companies that are now becoming the biggest financial institutions in terms of value rather than the banks. So my current feeling is, it is it's those type of digital native organizations that will win in this market unless the financial institutions do a dramatic change. And I, I show the example of Ping An because it, it, it's a good example of what you can do if you're committed to this. Ping An is a, was a Chinese insurer 30 years ago, but it looked at what Alibaba and Tencent and others were doing you know, five, 10 years ago. And it said, we want to operate like, like that. We want to create a digital business model like that. And the leader said, we are no longer an insurance company. We're a tech company that happens to have financial services licenses. And once he said that, that changed the whole culture of the organization. And they created a strategy and executed it really well. And that has catapulted them to be the fifth most valuable financial institution in the world. So it is possible for incumbents to compete, but they need to think dramatically differently outside of their normal way of thinking and invest heavily, reallocate capital to the types of platform business models that will be successful in enabling embedded finance. Yeah, so clearly it's, it's a threat right, to the incumbents. But if the incumbents get it right, you have an estimation of the increase in the percentage of revenue or return of equity that you think banks could achieve if they effectively deploy and execute an embedded finance strategy? It's a very good question. In fact, I, I've spoke to a CEO of a Mexican bank. I, I won't say who uh, recently. And uh, uh, he is looking to invest heavily in this area. And he said that he believed that in three or four years time, half of his return on equity will come from what he called bank as a service. I would call it embedded finance uh, propositions. So what, what that means is he's increasing his, his total uh, return on equity by 50% if he uh, executes effectively, going from a very difficult um, business model, which is the banking business model today, but adding on top of that, the digital business model. Now, another example is from um, the Far East, another big bank in Singapore I spoke to recently um, said that you know, it's making a big play in this area as well. And it felt that it's new, again, it called it bank as a service platform could be as valuable as the whole core bank 
in five years' time. So these are very meaningful uh, develop, you know, opportunities if, 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 the, if the bank or the insurance company can be committed to this. Yeah, we're running out of time. One last question from my side. What action would you recommend to a bank or an insurance to tackle this opportunity? Right. Yeah, well, I think there are, th there are three things to do. The first thing is to really understand the opportunity in detail at the very top of the company. So work out where to play in this market and what assets you can leverage to, to win. That's one thing. The, the second thing is critical, is not try to execute this from within the core business because the antibodies will kill any new type of business model that competes with its, the, the normal ways of working. So you need a separate organization to drive this forward. And that's what BBVA has done with Open Platform. It's been what other companies are doing, Marcus, Goldman Sachs, Marcus. And thirdly, you need to um, execute in collaboration with digital entrepreneurs. So these, the skills to do create these types of platforms don't necessarily reside in the corporation. You need to find tried and tested entrepreneurs that you can create new ventures with and, and, and nurture them within a separate organization over here. So those are the three things. Fully understand the opportunity and take the time to do so. Create a separate organization, collaborate with entrepreneurs who know how to drive this forward. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. I would like to open up the questions uh, from the public. We have more than 800 people registered. So maybe we have some, some good questions for Simon. Uh, you could send your questions through SparkUp in the QR code that has been projected on the screen or the URL finlavista.sparkup.live. So I think we have in here a few questions. The first one is, do you think that banks could become commoditized in the market of embedded finance? Well, absolutely. If you remember that diagram I showed of the, of the, the stack, the industry stack, the danger is that the, the banks just become license providers. You know, they, they, they rent out their license to, to innovative fintechs or other players. And uh, most of those other parts of the stack, as I said, can now be provided by, by, other, by digital companies and, and fintechs. So that is the real danger, yeah. Okay, one last question. Will Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook transform the market industry with embedded finance? I think so, because that's where people spend so much of their time and uh, on these platforms and, and, and you know, the platforms that you have in Latin America as well. So um, they, these companies are never going to be banks. They don't want to be license holders. But again, they can embed financial services into their uh, platforms and ecosystems, uh, again, potentially commoditizing uh, the, the banks, unless the banks can provide much more of the, the stack to, to those companies. And then there's a, great, there's a great opportunity to collaborate, certainly.